quando ligasse me avisa. Só um minuto. Quando eu falar ok, está funcionando, tá? Tá. Ok. Boa noite. Boa noite a todos. Né? É, nós vamos hoje fazer mais uma live. Hoje nós vamos falar da homocistinúria. Né? E eu queria agradecer muito ao professor Enk, que ele está sempre pronto a nos ajudar. Ele já veio algumas vezes no Brasil ajudar, já ajudou bastante a gente. E a doutora Ida, né? que está sempre também pronta para nos ajudar, está sempre nos ajudando. Então, como eu não sei falar inglês e tal, a doutora Ida vai assumir né, o papel ali, que ela pode conversar melhor com eles. Agora, para quem está assistindo, é, vou, vou ensinar como que escolhe a língua. Né? Se você... Embaixo da sua tela tem três pontinhos. Nesses três pontinhos, tem, você aperta, aí vai estar escrito português ou inglês. Se você quer ouvir em português, você bota português. Se você quer ouvir em inglês, você bota em inglês. Né? Aí, depois que eu terminar de falar, a, eu vou pedir para a moça, para a doutora Ida explicar isso também para quem está assistindo em inglês que não está conseguindo entender ainda o que eu estou falando. Aí, doutora Ida, fala isso aí em inglês, porque às vezes a pessoa não escolheu o canal do inglês ainda e ela não, tá, não vai conseguir, né? Então, uhum. depois a gente volta a conversar, né? Vamos agora falar um pouco da homocistinúria. Vai, doutora Ida. E tu queres que eu fale inglês agora, Simone? É só para explicar para as pessoas apertar esses três botãozinhos e escolher o um inglês, né? Uhum. Uh, so, good evening to everyone. It's a It's a pleasure for us to have this live with uh, Professor Hank Blom. I thank thank Professor Hank very much. And uh, uh, Simone was trying to explain before uh, how the channel for the translation uh, works. So you have at the bottom of the screen uh, like three points. And uh, this is a place where you can choose or the English translation or the Portuguese translation. You should do it uh, right now before we start the presentation, okay? Alguma coisa mais, Simone? Simone, any observation in the chat? No. Okay. Uh, Professor Blon who, who will speak to us. Uh, we are not sure if uh, for about 40 minutes or something like that. And after that, uh, we will open uh, like the space for questions. Uh, you can use the uh, chat for writing your comments and the questions. Simone and I will be reviewing the chat uh, uh frequently during the session so any problem you have with the translation or even with the sign of the internet please write uh, in the chat uh, uh, space okay so professor blom now it's your turn we know that you are five hours ahead so thanks very much again okay thank you very much Of course, I'd like first like to thank Simona and also uh, and the Mass Metabolic Group and uh, Ida for the uh, possibilities to, to lecture uh, about my, uh, my field, homocystinuria. So I'm very happy to share my knowledge with, uh, with people all around the world, with, with patients, their families, and uh, scientists and doctors. And I'm always happy to, to, to discuss and to... to to provide my knowledge to to give a better diagnosis and treatment for this uh, this group of inborn errors of metabolism well uh, the uh, it's not as as already uh, simona told i've been in brazil before not many times but a few times but i was very happy to be in uh, in brazil it's a very interesting country the first time i was uh, it was in porto alegre and then we had our first uh, brazilian meeting of patients and families with homocystinurias and metabolic acidemias. And 
two years later, we had even a, an international uh, patient expert meeting in Rio, which is also quite successful. And today is the, the third time uh, we can meet and, and uh, I can lecture and we can discuss uh, on, on homocysteinuria today. And I'm very uh, happy to do so. Well, I will show you the metabolism many, many times until you can uh, dream it. Uh, I will use it today to explain a uh, lot, lot of things about homocysteine, homocysteinuria and the disorders. First, I go quickly through the pathway. And uh, if to explain homocysteine, we have to start at methionine. Actually, we have to start at proteins. Our body consists of sugars, fats and proteins. And proteins consist about of 20 amino acids and one of them is methionine. So if, if the proteins are degraded, methionine is formed. And methionine has a very peculiar metabolism, which I'll go through uh, quickly. And uh, methionine is activated by uh, ATP to form acetonazolmethionine. Now, why do we have acetonazolmethionine? That is because this is the metal donor in the body. It, do it methylates DNA, proteins, uh, neurotransmitters. There are more than 200 different metal transferase reactions in our body. So this is really a very important uh, metabolism. And that's the whole reason why we have uh, homocysteine, because it's a product of this uh, metal transfer reaction. These reactions occur in every cell and they are crucial for adequate cell function. The product is as the homocysteine, ADO homocysteine here, and that is normally uh, hydrolyzed into homocysteine and adenosine. It's in interesting or important to, to know that the equilibrium of this reaction is in the direction of as the homocysteine. As a consequence, if homocysteine accumulates, also as the homocysteine will accumulate, and this is an inhibitor of many metal transferase reactions. So. One of, the, one of the underlying mechanisms why, why high homocysteine is uh, bad for the body is that it inhibits uh, metal transferase reactions. And as I explained before, metal transferase is uh, essential for cell function. And uh, this can explain to quite an, some extent why diseases which cause homocysteine accumulation, why they are bad for the body and we'll come to back later in the lecture to which kind of organs and systems are involved in this. If you have any questions, I know it's a bit difficult with this, uh, with, uh, when we have a lecture like this, but still if you have questions, you can always ask me also during my lecture. But, uh, homocysteine itself is as the branch point of uh, different reactions. Here's homocysteine is depicted here. It can be degraded to cystatinine and then to cysteine and then further down the line to sulfate. And the first step is catalyzed by cystatinine beta synthase, which is uh, the enzyme which when there's a defect, we talk about classical homocysteinuria. And this enzyme needs B6 to function well. Homocysteine can be degraded, but homocysteine can also be remethylated back to methionine. And therefore we have the enzyme methionine synthase. And this enzyme requires vitamin B12 for proper function. And it, re it needs a metal group because as I told you in the metal transferase reactions, we lose a metal group. And here, when we go back to methionine, it, we need a metal group again. And that comes in many cases from folate. Five metal tetrahydrofolate donates a metal group to homocysteine and then we have methionine again. This circle, this reaction, this metal uh, circle uh, occurs in every cell. Even the red blood cell met has metal transferase reaction. So um, the metal, 5-metal tetrahydrofolate is formed from 5-10-methylene tetrahydrofolate. And this reaction is catalyzed by MTHFR or methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase. Uh, Sorry if I speak these enzymes very quickly, but we'll use the abbreviations uh, during my lecture. So MTHFR forms 
metal tetrahydrofolate. And this needs a vitamin B2, vitamin B2 to, for proper function. Folate is also B vitamin, sometimes called B9 or sometimes even called B11, but it's also a B vitamin. So B vitamins play an important role in homocysteine metabolism. And all these red enzymes, CBS, methionine synthase, MTHFR, if they are deficient, they cause homocysteinuria. Um, as I told before, the, we have this, this um, metabolism because we need the metal groups. And therefore, acetanazolmethionine, ADOMET here, is the main regulator of this pathway. It means if we eat a lot of proteins, methionine is high, methionine is high. It will inhibit MTHFR, uh, so we have no little metal tetrahydrofolate and homocysteine cannot be remethylated. And at the same time, acetanazolmethionine will activate CBS, so homocysteine will be degraded. So if we have high intake of methionine, the acetanazolmethionine will regulated in such a way that we degrade homocysteine. On the other hand, if we have low intake of proteins, fasting or uh, when we eat little meat, then as the methionine goes down, CBS will be not activated and MTHFR will not be inhibited. So then we form metal tetrahydrofolate and homocysteine can be remethylated back to methionine. So the system is very well regulated and that is all still because we need these metal groups. I explained this regulation because later in my lecture I will need it to explain certain uh, parts of uh, classical homocysteinuria. And there is also another reaction in the liver and kidney. We also have betaine homocysteine methotransferase, BHMT, which use betaine to donate a metal group to homocysteine to form back methionine. So there are a lot, a, lot, a lot of aspects and I'll explain them now because later when we talk about treatment, these reactions will, will come back in my lecture. So what, what are the causes of uh, elevated homocysteine? And I'll go to that in a, if we have CBS deficiency or classical homocysteinuria, CBS is not functioning. That means homocysteine cannot be degraded to cystatine in the system, which will be decreased. Homocysteine will be increased, but everything above also. So we see high methionine, high acetanazole methionine, high acetanazole homocysteine, all will be elevated. And because high acetanazole methionine inhibits MTHFR, we see low metal tetrahydrofolate in CBS deficiency, which is important when we want to treat this condition. We also have MTHFR deficiency, then the body cannot form metal tetrahydrofolate, homocysteine cannot be remethylated to methionine. Homocysteine goes up, but methionine is low in this condition, and as then as methionine is low, as the homocysteine is high, homocysteine is high, and cystatinine is high because this reaction will run more frequently. Then we have methionine synthase deficiency. Again, the homocysteine cannot be remethylated to methionine. Methionine is low, as the methionine is low, homocysteine is high, as the homocysteine is high, and cystatinine is high. In this condition, folate will be increased because folate cannot go through. Uh, in the body at even 5 metal tetrahydrofolate will accumulate. <coughs> so we will see high folate in this condition. And the same is true when people are B12 deficient or uh, they have a defect in the metabolism of vitamin B12. There are a lot of enzymes involved and before vitamin B12 can be play its role as a vitamin in the body and all defects, uh, there are more than 15 defects known in the whole B12 pathway. I'll not go into that today at all because that uh, takes too much time. But it's important to know that there are also defects in vitamin B12 metabolism. And the most common one is cobalamin C. And I will talk a little bit about cobalamin C later in my lecture. 
So when do we talk about homocysteinuria or severe hyperhomocysteinemia? We talk, we, we talk about this when homocysteine is higher than 50 and where normal homocysteine is below 15. And then we, ha then we have to consider deficiencies of, of the three enzymes uh, I've discussed before. So CBS deficiency, MTHFR and methionine synthase dysfunction in one errors of silver amino acid metabolism. But there are also other causes for high homocysteine and even more common. People can be very deficient in folate or very deficient in vitamin B12. And there is also an, uh, a SNP in MTHFR, a common um, variant. And together with low, with relatively low folate, this can also cause uh, very high homocysteine. So these are the common causes of severe hyperhomocysteinemia or homocysteinuria. And the rare conditions are the inborn errors, CBS, MTHFR, and methionine synthase. And here are the, the, the incidence rates. MTHFR deficiency is a very rare, one and a half million births in uh, more or less worldwide. Cobalamin C, maybe one in 100,000. And CBS deficiency is a bit strange because you see that I depict here there is the the Zhejiang Islands that's uh, near uh, Taiwan. There, there, that's a very small island, and they have a population of people who have an incidence of classical homocysteinuria and one in two hundred and forty birds. So that is a very, very high incidence. It's probably an inbred for a long, long, long time. Also in Qatar, there it's a very uh, homocysteinuria is very common. One in 1,500 birds in Qatar concern a classical homocysteinuria patient. That's, that, then that's not even considered a rare inborn error of metabolism anymore. In these countries, it's very common. But in other countries, it's way less common. I will go into more detail in the incidence because, as I said, this is the incidence worldwide. It varies, it fluctuates enormously. It has be, been also a point of discussion. In Germany, they did a small study on one mutation, and they found a couple of heterozygotes in a small group of a couple of hundred people from Germany. And then they calculated that the incidence of class homocysteinuria should be one in 70,000. That would mean that there would be way much more patients than we, uh, we are aware of, because in Europe, we are, if we count the number of patients we know, then the incidence will be one in 200,000. So this is a huge discrepancy. And also studies in Denmark and in Norway, but even higher, using very small populations, they came to very high incidences of classical homocysteinuria. So I discussed this with Ida and we, we did a study on this because there is really a discrepancy in, uh, in, 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 in we see uh, not so many patients as we would predict on, on these small studies. So how can we study the real, uh, how can we do a decent study on the incidence of classical homocysteinuria? For that, uh, the PhD student Giovanna Weber-Horst did a uh, study uh, using the, the Genomat database. And it's depicted here, I'll go into more detail. Genomat is an uh, a database for many, many studies, and it totally concerns 100, more than 125,000 exomes and even more than 50,000 whole genome sequences of all kinds of groups. There can be patients, it can also be uh, population genetic studies. So it's a diverse group, but it's a huge group, and they have sequenced the DNA, at least the exomes of many of these people. So this, and these people are from all over the world. So we use this uh, database to calculate the incidence of classical homocysteinuria. Um, so the main result is that if we look in if we look in uh, in uh, in Europe, then we see that the incidence is about one in hundred thousand births. So that's uh, here depicted here. One in a thousand birds, and Latin America, it's about half in hundred thousand birds. So this is a normal uh, inborn error of metabolism. It's a rare condition, and even in Africans, 
it's even lower. It's even 0.2 in 100,000. And in Asia, it's a very rare inborn error of metabolism because they have calculated only uh, less than um, one fifth of a million births concerns classical homocysteinuria. So this is, and, and when you can also calculate the worldwide, then it's 0.38 for 100,000 births. This is much closer to the, to the number of patients we are aware of in Europe and in, in, in uh, Latin America and North America and also in Asia. Because we think that these numbers are more realistic than these studies published on very small populations and that they are probably not correct. We also looked at the, that, um, at the pathogenic alleles distribution over the world. And in particular, one common one is the isolution of threonine, which is called the blue, which is the most common um, mutation in, in Northwest Europe, and but also in Brazil and in the United States. Other mutations is the, um, is the this one, the orange one, is which is a, a Celtic mutation, and the gene that is mainly present in, in Ireland and also in Australia, because many Irish people went to Australia. Um, then in Qatar, there's this, this uh, Argentine 216 variant is uh, very common in, in two tribes in, in Qatar. If we look at this uh, isolution to three ring uh, variant, uh, which is quite common, you can see that in, in more than 50% of the alleles in Northwest Europe, also Italy, England, well, England is not Europe anymore. So they have, they concern this uh, variant. And this, this is interesting because this mutation is very well responsive to vitamin B6. I'll come back later to the B6 responsiveness, but these pa patients are generally uh, respond very well to vitamin B6, which is very nice, very very elegant way to treat. Um, yes. Then we go on to the clinical presentation of uh, CBF deficiency or classical homocysteinuria. There are four main features, such as uh, skeletal abnormalities, morphologic features, scoliosis, mental retardation, uh, venous and uh, arterial occlusive disease, so premature arteriosclerosis and thrombosis, and ectopia lentis. I'll go to that again, scoliosis, and you see that the spine is not in the, not the straight line, is really curved. And this is a patient, CBS deficient patient from Nijmegen, and he has all features associated with CBS deficiency. His eye lenses are removed because he had ectopia lentis, he has marfanoid features, uh, very long arms and legs. And that's also uh, uh, spider-like fingers. You can also see he has also scoliosis, as I showed in the previous slide. He is uh, severely mentally handicapped. And he had uh, two times he had a, a, a thrombosis. So he suffered from all, all, all clinical complications we know with CBS deficiency. But we also know that many, many patients have only one or two of these symptoms. So it's not that in this condition, people have always, patients always have all these, all these symptoms. Often it's only one or two. The ectopia lentis is also an interesting and a very, a very peculiar condition because it's a very rare uh, thing that to happen that the islands uh, is this detached so that because uh, because of the high homocysteine and probably also because of the low cysteine the fibrils which uh, are, are connected to the islands to keep it in position uh, break and then the islands falls down inwards or outward um, so if a patient has uh, at ectopia lentis next to my fan syndrome which is another condition people eye doctors should always uh, exclude classical homocysteinuria. Because of this phenomenon, this very peculiar phenomenon, we studied the relation between homocysteine and, uh, and refraction. And uh, we did that in the Gutenberg Health Study. Gutenberg has a, a big an area in Germany, and then more than 15,000 people participated in a huge study. And they were adults between 35 and 74. 
And we thought that maybe uh, people with high homocysteine have uh, not so good eye lens fibrils and they have high refraction. So we were very, uh, I was very enthusiastic that we could do this study with such a huge population. But the result is really is a negative result in a way, because in the, here you can see on the x-axis homocysteine levels in these individuals. And on the y-axis you see the, the, the mean spherical equivalent, so the diopters to make it simple. So people uh, of older age, above 20, often wear glasses. And many have minus two, minus five, many minus six, seven. And some people have even minus 10. So our hypothesis would be that, that the people who have uh, minus 10 or even more would have high homocysteine, but we don't see that at all. So if you look at homo, the higher homocysteine levels, these people have the same refraction as the people with low homocysteine. So it was in a way a negative result, but that's also the way science is. You know, you do studies and sometimes you find something, and sometimes you find nothing, but that's, so we published this last year, this year in, in uh, PLOS One, which is a very nice journal. I continue a little bit on the clinical presentation of the homocysteinurias, and then in the, this, and then I compare CBS deficiency with the cobalamin C uh, deficiency and HFR deficiency. And this is just so a neonatal per period and early infancy, and you can see that acute neurologic deterioration is not present in the classical homocysteinuria, but cobalamin C and MTHFR, this is really a severe, can be a very severe problem. Seizures, we don't see them only in the MTHFR in this early period of life. Developmental delay can be in all three forms of homocysteinuria. Hydrocephalus, we see, can see that in MTHFR deficiency and uh, sometimes in cobalamin C, but not in, in classical homocysteinuria. Nystagmus is only uh, confined to uh, cobalamin C defect. If we look at late infancy and childhood, then we see that the stroke, stroke-like and arterial and venous occlusive disease can occur in all, in all conditions and all, all forms of homocysteinuria. And if you look at neurologic deterioration, that's mainly confined to the, to the remethylation defects, uh, to the cobalamin C and MTHFR. Spastic tetraparesis and also uh, peripheral neuropathy and cerebral ataxia, these neurologic conditions, we don't see them in this period of life in the, in the in the CVS deficiency, but we do see them in the remethylation defects. Lens dislocation is mainly related to classical homocysteinuria. We don't see that. There are a few cases reported, but it's very rare in the remethylation defects. Autistic features also in classical homocysteinuria, developmental delay, also all three conditions, also seizures, psychiatric symptoms, and Again, the stachmus is only confined to the cobalamin C defect. Yeah. Then in uh, adolescence and in adulthood, we see uh, again the neurologic deterioration, acute, subacute, and chronic, is present in the cobalamin C and MTHFR, and also the combined degeneration of the spinal cord. But again, the, the vascular complications in the venous or in the arteriosis can be present in all three forms of homocysteinuria, mental retardation too, unexplained psychiatric symptoms in all three conditions and also seizures. Well, myoclonia only in, the, in remethylation effects and again in the stagmus is generally only seen in the cobalamin C defect. Well, how do we do the the laboratory diagnosis of homocysteinuria. So if patients, if people, if patients have symptoms related to, to uh, homocysteinuria, so you want to, ex do want to explore if there is really a defect. So the, 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 whole, the starting point is of course to measure homocysteine. And it's important in this, in this that to know that homocysteine in plasma 
is mainly bound to albumin. About 80% is bound to albumin. Then another um, 10-15% is bound to cysteine and to homocysteine itself. Then we get homocysteine, it's a disulfide of homocysteine. And only 1% of the total homocysteine is free homocysteine. So we want to have a good estimate of homocysteine. You have to measure the whole, the whole sum of all these compounds of homocysteine. And that's now generally very easy available. In most clinical chemistry laboratories have an assay for homocysteine. So that is nowadays every doctor could should have should be able to have their homocysteine measured in a patient if they suspect suspect uh, homocysteinuria. If they want to exclude homocysteinuria. The next step is to measure the other metabolites in the homocysteine uh, metabolism, cysteine, methionine, cysteine, and metabolomic acid. Folate and B12 should be measured. And then one can measure enzyme activities in cells and do DNA diagnostics. But in general, the enzymes are in most cases not measured. Uh, it's made, most diagnoses are made on the metabolites and then uh, doctors go directly to the DNA diagnostics. Treatment of homocysteinuria. It's an uh, interesting aspect of this metabolism that we can influence it in several ways. We can influence the, the metabolism and in, in this way of treat the metabolism. It's important to understand that uh, CBS, as I told before, has vitamin B6 as cofactor. And this is also used as a treatment. Uh, also vitamin B12 we can provide. We can, um, vitamin B2 is not given in classical homocysteinuria, but in NTHFR deficiency it is. And also folate is also given. I'll go to that once again in several steps. At the first, if a patient uh, has, it has been diagnosed with classical homocysteinuria or CBS deficiency, the first step should be treatment of folate deficiency because most patients are folate deficiency uh, are folate deficient at diagnosis and that is again can be explained by by this slide because if a cbs is is uh, deficient homocysteine accumulates and also methionine and acetylcysteine and acetylcysteine inhibits mthfr and the metal tetrahydrofolate is not formed and metal tetrahydrofolate is the circulating form of folate. So people who have CBS deficient are often at diagnosis deficient in folate. So that should be treated first before anything else will be done. Folate deficiency should be treated. And uh, sometimes from the same reason, patients can also be deficient in vitamin B12. Okay. It's also interesting if one provides folate or metal tetrahydrofolate folate that it's also a substrate. So it can push the reaction homocysteine back to methionine. And because we still think that homocysteine is the, is the, the accumulation of homocysteine is the, the, bad, the bad guy in this, uh, this respect and we want to have homocysteine as low as possible, it's good to have to lower homocysteine at the expense of higher methionine. So use folate, and I think the folate, if possible, use folinic acid. I have a typo here, but uh, folinic acid is the, the form of folate I, I, I like to recommend to use. And vitamin B12 should be moni monitored. The next test is to test uh, to see if the patient is vitamin B6 responsive. And patients can be fully responsive, and that means that the homocysteine levels can be even close to normal, they can be partial responsive and uh, also uh, can be non responders. And this is because vitamin B6 is a cofactor of CBS. And if CBS is mutated, vitamin B6 uh, can sort of uh, push the, the mutated CBS in a form which is more responsive. So it's a sort of, uh, it, it, it influence the structure of the CBS protein in such a way that it becomes more active 
and homocysteine can be can be converted and in this way can be lowered. In, worldwide, about 50% of the patients are B6 responsive. And this mainly depends on the on the mutation, which kind of mutation patients have. The, the third option, and this is particularly important in the non-responders, in the vitamin B6 non-responders, and that is because it's protein restriction or methionine restriction. Methionine comes from the proteins. So if we have a low methionine in the diet, and it means a, a methionine as a low protein diet with, uh, with supplementation of all the other amino acids and not methionine, the homocysteine level can be uh, very well decreased, but it's a very difficult diet. It's uh, very difficult for people, for patients to, to stay on the diet. And the fourth option we have is the use of betaine. Uh, also in the introduction, I told that to be in the liver and the kidney, we have the betaine homocysteine metatransferase enzyme and betaine can just be given in relatively high dose and it pushes the reaction from homocysteine to methionine. Can even be so efficient that methionine levels become too high. I and mean, we don't want methionine to be higher than 800 or higher than 1000. A couple of years with Manuel Schiff from Paris, we, we made some, uh, some suggestions how, how about the treatment. So if you have CBS deficiency, you have the low methionine diet, you have the B6 responsiveness, we, we recommend in infants 50, 250 milligrams per day, and in children and adults, a higher dose, up to 500 milligrams per day. The non-responders, we still recommend to use some B6 because it's very difficult to say people is really totally non-responsive. There may be some effect still of the vitamin B6. So generally we recommend still to use some vitamin B6 in uh, even if patients are considered non-responsive. Then the folinic acid in the dose are one to, five, one to five milligrams per day. Cobalamin, hydroxycobalamin can be given once a week. One milligram can be taken orally. There's no, no need to inject this. It can just be orally, it's more than, it's good. It should not be injected. And betaine. High dose in children, 150 to 250 milligrams per kilogram per day, and in adults, 5 to 20 grams. You see, it's a very high dose, grams per day, and then uh, about uh, two times a day. Also, we give some suggestions about the treatment of the MTHFR and the uh, cobalamin C. Um, um, but we, uh, for today, I will not go into detail with that because they all these have very specific additional way how to treat this condition. For further reading, I also recommend to, to read our guidelines we published uh, three years ago in the Journal of Inherited Metabolic Disease. <clears throat> there we also go through all the steps in treatment of uh, classical homocysteinuria. And does the treatment help? It's of course you can give treatment, but is it really of any use? Well, if you look at the homocysteine levels, you can see here, this is the isoleuse to threonine mutation. This is very well B6 responsive. You see that on vitamin B6, homocysteine drops dramatically. And the, if you use even other treatment, then they have very low homocysteine levels. Other mutations as the various responsive, but also in uh, by using all the treatment strategies, one can dramatically lower homocysteine. Is this of any any clinical uh, significance? This is of course a next important question. Well, therefore, I have first uh, go to one for one study. I have first uh, I have to explain the relation between vascular disease and uh, and, and uh, classical homocysteinuria. On the y-axis is depicted the uh, the percentage of patients who had a thromboembolic event and on the x-axis the age of the patients <clears throat> and you can see here that there are patients with classical this is a study from Harvey Mudd already published in 1985 and it's still a very good study if people want to uh, read more about classical homocysteinuria this is an excellent study to uh, to read but what we can see from the study that around the age of 25, about 
of the patients have had a thromboembolic event, which is a very peculiar because normally people at young age have no uh, thromboembolic event. Seven Yap um, did a study uh, already a couple of years ago, already 20 years ago, and she studied 158 patients from Sydney and Nijmegen, Dublin, Manchester, and London. And, um, and totally, he has had the, the years of treatment were almost 3,000 years of treatment by putting all these patients together. If we look at the study of Harvey Mudd, at this study, then we would expect to see 112 patients with a thromboembolic event. And these patients on treatment, only 17 had a thromboembolic event. So you see about a tenfold reduction in incidence of thromboembolic events due to treatment. And you can also calculate the risk ratio 0.09, and this is a confidence interval. This study clearly shows that the risk for the thromboembolic complications uh, is dramatically reduced by treatment. And all these clinical symptoms we see in classical homocystinuria, the, the risk of these complications can be reduced. So of course, if the islands are removed, they will not come back again, they cannot treat it. But if people have minus five diopters and they take treatment, then you see that they don't, uh, that, the, uh, that, that the, the eyesight uh, stabilizes. Also the skeletal abnormalities stabilizes and mental retardation stabilizes and also the vascular complications I showed you in the previous slide can be prevented. So treatment is not perfect, but it can uh, prevent, uh, the, it can lower the, the risk of complications uh, clearly. Well, That's what I like to tell and like to look forward to see you in Brazil in the future. And uh, I enjoy uh, the Matata week. I hope to drink one soon again after the after the COVID uh, crisis is uh, out of the world. And I sent you the greetings from uh, Erasmus University Medical Center, which is depicted on this slide. It's uh, the biggest medical center in the, in the Netherlands. And this is the view from the building. This is the harbor in Rotterdam. Uh, I recommend if you have any time visit the Netherlands, also visit Rotterdam. It's a beautiful architecture. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Hank. I'm in time now. Okay. We have many, many questions and comments on the chat, but Simone, maybe you could start answering any something. Podia começar perguntando, Simone? No. Teu microfone está mudo, Simone. Ah, eu vi ali. Ali tem oh, uma, eu vou pelas, pela, pelos pacientes, né? Porque o deles eu já sei qual é a dúvida. É, as meninas aqui já estão começando a ficar mocinhas, né? Então as mães estão muito preocupadas sobre gravidez na homocistinúria, né? Porque elas não sabem é, qual remédio, qual anticoncepcional pode tomar, se pode ou se não pode, quais são os riscos, né? Eu vejo que elas têm muitas dúvidas com relação à gravidez, que elas já estão começando a namorar, né? Yes, the, um, there are very, uh, well, first of all, when women are considered to become pregnant, they should go to the doctor and have their homocysteine uh, checked and <coughs> sorry, have them optimize the treatment again. But um, the risk for the, for, the, for, the, for the fetus, for the offspring, for the baby, it's not, uh, not, not, uh, there are no uh, severe, uh, not, not, it's not described that it's bad for the, for the, for the baby. But the mother itself, if the, um, the pregnancy can be an episode of a higher risk of thrombosis and, uh, around delivery and also the use of anti oral anticonceptive is also um, a higher risk for thrombosis. 
So people should really uh, take um, um, uh, probably uh, low dose aspirin or low dose heparin to uh, reduce the risk for thromboembolic complications. That answers the question. I think so. Alguma coisa mais, Simone, dessa parte de gestação, yeah. tu acha? Yeah, eu acho que sim, eu acho que deu para entender. Uh, I, uh, one thing that I think it's important, I will ask Hank to comment, is that the main problem when a woman with classical homocystinuria is pregnant, do you think that the main problem is for the woman or for the fetus? Yeah, What the I mean, uh, they have a higher risk to have the baby with some abnormality? No, the, the risk for the baby is very small. And it, uh, the risk is mainly the mother. Okay. Uh, there are no, I'm not aware of uh, babies who have uh, congenital abnormalities uh, also uh, from mothers with homocystinuria. So the risk is mainly the mother itself and not so much, not, not uh, the baby. Doutora Ida, a, tem uma mãe perguntando se é comum num paciente de homocystinuria ele ter distonia. Mm -hmm. uh, Hank, uh, there are now, we have many questions regarding like the mutation, betain, but we will start with like a more clinical question. Do you know if dystonia, dystonia is frequent in patients with classical homocystinuria? Movement abnormalities? No, no it's not that common. No. Okay. It can be secondary maybe, but not, uh, not, not the main mm -hmm. symptom. Regarding the uh, B6, okay, uh, because we have some patients uh, from the CBLC group, okay, and one question from the CBLC group is if uh, uh, those patients, if they need to be on B6 therapy. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Um... Um, people do, uh, re in general, it is recommended to use some vitamin B6 to stimulate CBS to degrade homocysteine, but there are no studies uh, showing uh, it's beneficial. So it's, it's, it's a matter of discussion. If, if patients with uh, cobalamin C should take uh, additional uh, B6, but in general, we, at least I recommend to, to get use a low dose, even even lower than we published uh, a while ago. So maybe 10 or even five, uh, maybe 25 milligrams per day. But if patients have to take a lot of treatment and, and, and any additional treatment is of course uh, cumbersome. It's uh, difficult to take all the treatment. So it, B6 is not really uh, very important in, in these cobalamin C defects. But okay. Uh, you know, the president of our Latin America Society on Embarrers of Metabolism is attending your lecture, she attended, and she, uh, is Aida, thanks very much for being with us. And she is asking if, uh, which is your opinion about the use of vitamin C in patients with classical homocystinuria who are not responsive to B6, like for protection of the vascular epithelium? Yes, it's, uh, there's no evidence. Dr. Aida, Dr. É só a senhora falar o nome da pessoa para mim, que eu boto ela ali, aí dá para ouvir a voz, ela, ela mesmo pode fazer a pergunta. Me tá. fala o nome que eu boto. Tá bem, então da próxima ah. vez né, a gente faz. Quem quiser falar, daí a gente pode fazer assim. Lembrando tá. que ele tem tradução, tá? Então pode, fala normal em português, enfim. Hank. Tô... About the vitamin C. Yes, there is. There, there's no 
no no evidence it's a, it's of beneficial effects it, it, um, the atherosclerosis is not uh, is a process which in which we believe also radical play an important role but we don't see really really clear atherosclerosis in in uh, classical homocysteine area we see more thrombosis uh, kind of mechanisms so in the artery and in the venous we see more a clotting uh, problem and in that uh, that respect it's not so uh, important to give uh, uh, radical scavengers like vitamin e and c and so on. there's not much i would not recommend to use high dose uh, vitamin c in uh, classical homocysteine area Simone, tu quer fazer um mix comigo? Daí tu pergunta, então? Assim, que que você... Doutora Ida? Oi. É para perguntar a ele, o paciente quando vai fazer o teste da piridoxina, né, um paciente que começou o tratamento, qual o máximo de tempo que ele acha que deva ficar no teste da piridoxina antes de iniciar a dieta? Hank, the families, they have lots of questions regarding yes. the responsiveness of B6. One question is uh, how much time we have to wait to see uh, if the patient is responsive or not. The mm -hmm. second question is if it's possible that at the beginning a patient is responsive, but uh, with the time he becomes non-responsive. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, the first uh, question is if, pa if people, if patients are picked up via uh, via uh, uh, selective screening, that means via when they have complications and go to a doctor, and then at, at, at the, after a period is found out that they have classical homocysteinuria, they should take high dose vitamin B6, as we have recommended, and take it for about four to six weeks before we can estimate, before they take a new plasma samples to measure homocysteine. So it should be about a month on B6 treatment to, to have a good evaluation. But this is by systematic screening. If you have newborn screening, it's a different story because newborn screening is not happening in many countries. And also I don't think in Latin America, there is a newborn screening on home, classical homocysteinuria, is it? No. Uh, um, maybe uh, now, uh, Simone, maybe you could, uh, uh, Simone, tu podia abrir o, o microfone da Aida, da professora Aida, da doutora Aida? Aqui só acontece quando a criança faz num particular. Uh, então, if they use the tandem, the neonatal screening by tandem, so the methionine is captured. Yeah. So uh, they consider to use uh, methionine as a biomarker for classical homocysteinuria in Brazil, or they will set it up. They will. They start already. What Hank? I didn't understand. It, uh, is, uh, do you in Brazil screen for classical homocysteinuria by methionine? Uh, we do not screen in the public system. But mm. the private system, when they use the tandem machine, they measure the, they see the methionine, methionine. So. Yeah. No, it's important because if you use methionine as a biomarker in numerous treatment, you only find B6 non-responsive patients. So in, in, uh, in Ireland and in England, they do also newborn screening. Then they do a very, still a very small test. They give the baby, uh, uh, B6 for a couple of weeks and then they measure homocysteine again. But they are generally non responsive. So if you find patients by methionine in numerous screening, they are well being um, not B6 responsive. Uh, and the second question oh, if uh, we have a patient who is responsive at the beginning, if with the time he can become non responsive. Yeah, you see sometimes you see in patients that in the years they, they become a little bit less responsive, particularly by young children. Young, you see sometimes they are very responsive and uh, still taking the same dose of B60, uh, homocysteine goes up. I, I, have, I have no good explanation for that. Um, it does happen, I know. 
but uh, I don't, I do not understand why. Uh, so it can be, but, but pe if people are really B6 responsive, they will stay B6 responsive, but response can be less. Okay. Uh, regarding the non-responsive patients, uh, people are asking, uh, which is your experience with the use of betaine for the treatment of this patient? And which would be the highest dosage of betaine that we can use for treatment? Yeah, this was in this slide. We can go back in this here. Yeah. You can see that Depends on the, just the beating dose is given here. You see for children, 150 to 250 milligrams per kilogram per day, two times a day, and adults five to 20 grams, max 20 grams, two, two times a day. So that's about the dose for, for beating. And the, the, was, the other question was about uh, if betaine is a good or like a bad drug for the treatment of non-responsive patients, what do you think? Yeah, it's we, useful and things like mm -hmm. that. I, I, I would recommend to, if people are not B6 responsive, to of course do the folate and B12, but try to, to get a, a methionine restricted diet as much as possible. It's a very difficult diet, and I think particularly in adolescence and adulthood, it's uh, uh, patients will not take it anymore. Um, but still, patients can still be uh, low in protein intake if possible. So I would say first say try to to get as low as possible in the proteins, which that will still affect your homocysteine level. And then in the second step is to use um, betaine. So betaine is not a first line treatment. The first line treatment is, should be low methionine, low protein. And then the second step use betaine. Doutor Aida? Oi. A, a, a mãe ali está perguntando que, que ele não respondeu por quanto tempo eles testam os recém-nascidos diagnosticados com relação ao B6. Now, uh, Hank, again, we will come back to the responsiveness test, okay? You told in your presentation that uh, uh, classical homocystinuria patients who are picked up by neonatal screening, probably they have the non-responsive form. Do you agree? Yes. This is, yeah, this is what we expect. So if uh, we uh, have a newborn uh, with the diagnosis of classical homocystinuria, for how much time we should test this newborn for responsiveness? If the baby is not, if the baby is picked up by newborn screening, yeah, only two weeks. Only two weeks. Okay. A short, a short period because uh, still you want to see if there's any response. Uh, if there is any response after two weeks, but uh, I, I am aware of newborn screening and I only one patient of the many patients I heard about, only one was partially responsive. In generally, patients who are responsive to B6 have normal methionine at birth. So you okay. cannot find them by methionine. And okay. uh, only the non-responsive ones have a high methionine after birth. Okay. Uh, we have many, uh, many questions uh, regarding classical hom homocystinuria, but I will change to the CBLC group, okay? They have uh, two questions. The first question is about folinic acid. If uh, you are aware of the difference between the use of folinic acid or uh, calcium folinate, okay? And, uh, okay, this first question, the, I do the second later. Yeah, if, if you, you can, folic acid can be bought in a pharmacy, it's very cheap, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a not a natural form of folate. So folic acid is the, it's a, needs to be reduced before it is active. And the folic acid is resembling 
the natural forms of folate. So it is inhibiting uh, folate metabolism. So I really recommend, particularly in the remethylation defect, like the cobalamin Cs, where they use a higher dose of, uh, of folate, they should, uh, I recommend fol folinic acid because that's a, a, a form of or used folate who is immediately available and um, that is probably better than, uh, than, fol than, than, than the synthetic form folic acid. Thank you. The second question is about B12, okay? The plasmatic levels of B12 in CBLC patients, because as they receive uh, B12, sometimes like uh, even every other day, uh, they usually have high levels of B12 in plasma. And uh, they, uh, they are asking if, uh, uh, what would be the like, uh, best level if they can trust in the levels as a biomarker of the treatment no it's no there's no there's no need to measure b12 on, on treatment in the cobalamin c patients they should take uh, a very high the highest dose of hydroxycobalamin uh, orally and uh, intramuscular and uh, the measurement of B12 has no use. It's a B12 will be sky high in, in, in plasma, in blood, but that uh, doesn't matter if it's 20,000 or 40,000 or 10,000. It has no, not, not, not much meaning. It does not use to monitor treatment. Okay, there is one question regarding the betaine uh, treatment. Uh, uh, what would be like the problem if the patient uses like a high dosage of betaine? I mean, what's the adverse event of betaine? What we should take care of? Yeah, the betaine does not, not much adverse events, and particularly not in remethylation defects. There is some uh, doubt uh, that the combination in classical homocystinuria, if they take very high dose, I mean, taking a higher dose than we recommend is of no use. It only costs money. And that is not more effective. Uh, this the dose we recommend, and also the the, the company recommend is uh, it, it doesn't help if to give any higher. And uh, there is some in, in classical homocysteineuria where methionine goes high. The combination of high beating and high methionine may be uh, bad for the for the patient. So don't take higher beating than recommended. Okay. Uh, now, regarding the genotype-phenotype association, uh, that mutation, I, I278T, okay? If the patient is uh, has one allele with this mutation and the second allele is like a very severe allele with a nonsense mutation, uh, what do you expect that the patient is responsive or non-responsive? It cannot be completely predicted. The genotype gives an indication, and many patients who have uh, the, the really good B6 responsive mutation in combination with another mutation are to some extent B6 responsive. But there are, are people who have such a combination who are not B6 responsive at all. So in this way, to understand this is that because the active CBS is a complex of four to eight uh, CBS proteins and how did that cluster together and some mutations have so much effect on this clustering bad effect on this clustering that there is no uh, room for B6 uh, responsiveness uh, so it cannot it can to a certain extent one can expect one can but it's not uh, not always the case no unfortunately Simone, mais alguma coisa? Simone? Hum. Tu tá com o fone desligado. Não, ninguém, nenhuma mãe mais me fez pergunta aqui pelo WhatsApp, não. As perguntas eram essas que foram respondidas. Hum, ok. Ok. 
Hank, Hank, we think uh, we asked uh, all the questions that mm -hmm. uh, we had in the chat. So I would like to know if uh, you have something else to tell us. We really appreciate it. Uh, the chat is in Portuguese, but after I can show you, people, they like, appreciated very much the, the lecture, okay? Uh, so thank you very much. It's my great, uh, really great pleasure to, to, uh, to, uh, to, to lecture. And next time I hope to be able to come to Brazil and to, to see, to look people in the eyes and to talk face to face, because that's more easy than, uh, in the, this system, but this is the second best option, I would say. And uh, I'm it's really, uh, really happy. I'm very pleased to do so. Okay, Simone, to quem será daí? Doutor Henk, o senhor sabe que o senhor sempre vai ser bem-vindo aqui no Brasil, né? Sempre, sempre nós vamos ter mais um pouquinho para aprender com o senhor. E todas as vezes que o senhor quiser vir, o senhor sabe que nós vamos estar lá na plateia assistindo o senhor falar. Two years time. One or two years time. Ok. <laughs> ok. Ele disse, Simone, que tem que agora esperar um ou dois anos por causa da pandemia. É, então, mas passa rápido, no instantinho chega. É. Sim. Então, eu acho que tu pode encerrar, né, Simone, tá certo? A gente agradece a presença de todos, eu acho Aham. que foi bem útil. Vamos agradecer os intérpretes também, eu acho que funcionou direitinho as coisas, né, Simone? Pra... É. Eu quero agradecer primeiro ao doutor Henk, que está sempre disposto a nos ajudar e falar para o senhor que, como mãe, né, eu digo, e para quem estiver assistindo, nós temos um tratamento muito difícil, mas um tratamento possível. Né? É, eu vejo que muitas pessoas têm muita dificuldade de conseguir fazer o tratamento, mas esse tratamento ele é possível de se fazer. Né? Hoje, meu filho faz o tratamento tão certinho que a gente está tendo que aumentar as taxas dele porque as taxas estão muito baixas. Mas é uma coisa que você tem que viver isso 24 horas, a família inteira, não só uma pessoa. É, infelizmente, com um diagnóstico tardio, a gente tem essa dificuldade mesmo. Né? A gente torce para que a gente comece a ter o diagnóstico precoce no Brasil e que os pacientes passam a, a, a ter o tratamento desde o nascimento agora. Nós só temos um paciente no Brasil com diagnóstico precoce, é uma menininha de um ano e pouco, né? ela está sendo tratada em São Paulo, acho que ela vai ser a nossa referência, né? porque é a primeira dos que eu conheço que teve o diagnóstico precoce aqui no Brasil. Todos os outros tiveram já o diagnóstico após alguma sequela, né? Mas a gente vem lutando bastante para que isso melhore aqui no Brasil. A doutora Ida tem ajudado bastante. A gente já conseguiu incorporar, fazer com que o governo desse a fórmula para a gente. Né? A betaína, ele vai dar logo em breve, também já estamos quase conseguindo. Os alimentos nós não temos aqui no Brasil, mas não tem mesmo, mas vamos ter. E vai faltar o diagnóstico precoce para uma cistinúria, mas eu tenho certeza que a gente, logo, logo, a gente vai conseguir esse diagnóstico precoce também, para a gente ter um, um, uns pacientes assim, com, com outro histórico, né? um histórico melhor. Né? Mas é, até que é, é. Eu não sei, eu, se eu pudesse, eu trazia todos eles aqui para minha casa e ia mostrar que o tratamento é possível, é difícil, mas é possível sim. É, é muito melhor ter, fazer esse tratamento difícil do que pensar que o filho possa ter algumas das sequelas que a gente sabe que pode ter, né? Então, muito obrigado por o senhor estar nos ajudando, né? A doutora Ida também, eu só tenho a agradecer, ela tem ajudado bastante, né? E as intérpretes, né? Eu não tenho nem palavras, tanto que eu tenho a agradecer a elas. Muito obrigado né, pela ajuda. Então... A senhora e ele, se quiser falar alguma coisa, doutora Ida, para se despedir, eu já me despedi. Eu queria, eu coloquei ali no chat, eu acho que eu agradeço a participação de todo mundo, né? 
No, eu estava controlando aqui o número de participantes, a gente chegou a ter, eu acho que quase 90, né? Teve. Uh, ou, ouvintes, e isso é muito legal, né? E Simone, parabéns também, obrigada por toda essa organização, se não fosse vocês, a gente não estava aqui, né? Isso é para provar que as coisas só acontecem no Brasil e no mundo se a gente começa a militar pela causa. Né? Então, parabéns para todas as famílias que estavam aqui com a gente, então, participando dessa Só uma parte. perguntinha, doutora Ida. Tem uma mãe aqui que é atrasada, passou uma mensagem para mim, eu Sim. até sei a resposta, né? Tá. Ela está me perguntando aqui no, no WhatsApp. Sobre a fórmula, ela reduz os riscos da trombo, da, das complicações? Vê se a minha resposta está certa. A fórmula só, só vai ser usada para quem não responde à piridoxina né? e que esteja fazendo uma dieta com restrição de proteína. E Sim. se isso acontecer, né? se ela conseguir fazer o tratamento e tal, usar a fórmula, as complicações vão diminuir, não é isso? Exatamente. exatamente. Ah, então, viu? Já estou até aprendendo um pouco. É bem isso. Então, ah, tá. então tá bom, então. Então, obrigada. Ele quer Dá falar pra... alguma coisa, doutor? Do you want to say the final words, Hank? Oh. Final words. About the treatment? Okay. Uh, yeah, the, uh, all treatments, uh, treatment helps. And uh, it can be better, it can be worse, but any treatment helps, even, uh, yeah. I, I use, I, as I said, I, I, people on our patients are not B6 responsive. They should uh, do their best on the diet, and it's very difficult, I know. But if they uh, take the betaine and take the folate, and uh, if they stay low in protein, they have still, uh, uh, the treatment still has a very good uh, effect on the outcome. Uh, still, the risk for com complications are there, but uh, the, the risk is much lower than untreated. Okay. Então, tchau para todo mundo, né? Thanks, Hank. Bye, bye. 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 Bye, tchau, tchau obrigada. Bye. Bye. Tchau. Pode desligar, Mickey.